the amount uh, 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 that can be saved by the implementation of the Inspire Directive. Um, and um, um, this, this report is actually online. It's the uh, refit report on the Inspire Directive. And uh, just to, to highlight some of the, uh, the uh, uh, um, estimates, actually, that were provided uh, uh, by, by some of the member states, so in terms of uh, cost savings. For instance, the, the UK estimated uh, uh, an equivalent of uh, 1 point, uh, 5 point 1 million uh, per year uh, in, in pounds of savings uh, as, a, as a consequence of the appropriate uh, um, implementation of the Inspire Directive. And of course, uh, we have a number of other cases, but um, I won't take uh, your time. Uh, now the, the floor, uh, I mean the, uh, the first speaker, um, uh, is already uh, uh, there. Um, it's uh, Torsten Rietz uh, from uh, Vettransform, Germany. Yep. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Welcome to the first uh, cost and benefits uh, presentation. So this is a joint presentation from Torsten Rietz over there. He will take over the, uh, the second part of the presentation. And uh, Martin Domeyer from Geschäftsstrategie die Südhessen. Uh, this is the organization uh, that initiated this uh, project and my name is Andreas from Deming from Bispire. Uh, so uh, we'd like to, um, yeah, i like to show you the, the story of GDI Südhessen. Um, yeah, where is GDI Südhessen? Uh, Hessen is a region of Germany and Südhessen is the south of Hessen and uh, to, to get an idea what, uh, about what location we are talking about, I, I'll show you the map here over there. Um, so, in this uh, location, we have many organizations, uh, regional, local organizations that want to implement Inspire and set up a uh, special data infrastructure. And um, yeah, I'd like to show you how they uh, work on this. So, basically, um, uh, they started within a project, within a cooperation project. Uh, cooperation between the local organization, administrative districts, and regional organizations. And um, yeah, first they started with a the project, then this got a permanent working group uh, since 2009. And the basic idea of uh, this cooperation uh, has a target, they want to establish. Uh, regional SDI. They want to make available the data sets uh, mostly because they want to um, yeah, enable uh, the processes in the communities to use the spatial data of the local data providers for their own benefit, but they also, of course, like to fulfill Inspire. And from their view, both is important, of course, uh, their local benefits, but also Inspire. And, well, if you ask them what is more important, you sometimes, yeah, they, they answer, okay, Inspire is important because these are the legal requirements, but for us, more important is that our, is our local benefit that we have. So it's, it's not just enough to implement Inspire and to be compliant. Uh, for us, it's very important that our local processes can use our local data and Inspire helps us very much on this because we can establish an SDI with Inspire, uh, but we have to focus also on our local benefit. And um, yeah, with this idea, they started in working groups. So their first question was, oh, what data do we need in our SDI? Um, so they started to investigate the local data sets that are already in place there. Uh, they started with an analysis of their communal uh, processes. Um, they took a look at the Inspire data models to check what is required from uh, Inspire. And they involved a lot of users and data providers. And uh, yeah, you see here a picture also from one of the working uh, shops where, uh, where they uh, work with the uh, local users and experts. And the outcome of this process uh, was, um, on the one hand, data models. They call them harmonized regional data models. These are not the Inspire models, 
but these are models uh, that have um, yeah, information they needed for the communal tasks. They are based on Inspire. For example, the mandatory fields you find in the Inspire da data models that are also in these data models. And this is quite important for this project. These models are very simple. So this is one approach uh, of this project that you have flat data models that are uh, usually can be implemented in a shapefile. And they also use shapefile templates for these data models. So the basic idea of these data models is uh, that a local data provider can prepare these uh, data sets with its own tools that it is usually uh, using. So he can use uh, its desktop GIS to create these data sets. Um, well, uh, the second result of this uh, process was uh, to create mapping tables. Uh, so these mapping tables are then the information how uh, you can map the information from the simple models to the Inspire data models. Okay, now this organization have defined in a process with all these users data models that were, they would like to have in their, in their regional SDI. Um, the next step would be how to implement it how to bring this into, um, into operation. There are a lot of questions, of course. Uh, what hardware do we need? What software? What does it cost? Uh, if everybody uh, created on its own, it's, it's very expensive. We need something else. We need an idea how we can um, manage it. Well, they started with this idea. They said, whoa, we need something, uh, something very easy, uh, from the user perspective, should be like a box. You open, you put your data inside, you press a button, uh, you press uh, play and start, and the result will be uh, yeah, uh, inspire uh, data sets and services. Um, so this should be the perspective from a, from a user. From a user, from a data provider that has to provide data. In this perspective, there's no expertise needed uh, to implement Inspire. Of course, this uh, washing machine, the, the central unit that needs to do all the stuff that the uh, uh, data provider does not have to take care for. Uh, so the basic idea was, it's called the Inspire, uh, Inspire um, GDE Inspire Umsetzer. That is a platform they want to have, and it's based on a product called Inspire GIS. And the basic idea is, uh, the data provider can upload its data in, a, in this simple data model, this harmonized uh, regional model. This information got published also to services. Um, so um, you have view service and download service on the simple data models. These are very useful in your regional SDI. But then there's also a pre-configured theme with the transformation made out of these mapping tables. So it's a transformation from the simple model to the Inspire data model. For example, they have a simple model about schools districts, and uh, they have a transformation uh, towards uh, the Inspire uh, theme of governmental services. So once you have transformed the information, you can publish the data as, um, uh, as Inspire data set in an Inspire view service and an Inspire download service. So the steps the communal data provider has to do is to pre prepare the local data sets according to the simple specification. This is something he can do with his tools. He has to upload the data set. He has to choose the program. I want a view service. I want the download service. And I want the Inspire profile. And for Germany, it's important also the, the German EDA profile. And he presses uh, the button to start the thing. And the important thing, and I think this is also the, the, uh, the success of this project here, is that the local data provider does not need anything about Inspire. Need to, uh, does not need to know anything about uh, Inspire. For example, the metadata got automatically generated. This is pre-configured. Many information um, 
get into the data, uh, get into the data sets and uh, metadata because, for example, the user is registered on the platform with the name of the organization and so on. This uh, gets automatically transformed into the metadata. Um, yeah, the, uh, the platform itself provides uh, the workflow for the user. It provides automatically validation of the input data set because if the, the input is okay and you have the transformation, uh, you can get uh, valid Inspire data sets. Um, yeah, you have automatic publishing of the view service, download service, the generation of the metadata, and uh, we also do uh, conformance testing. We use a Git EDA test suite uh, to test Inspire and Git EDA conformance, and we have a central hosting for this. So we use here a cloud solution, uh, for example. So this is uh, also uh, a certified solution uh, based on ISO standards. And with this central uh, solution, you can reduce cost because you have to do this just once, not for every data provider. Um, yeah, they started with uh, the school sites uh, data set, and they are at the moment ongoing to yeah, create this process for even more uh, data models, fire and rescue stations, for example, and the others. So in the next steps, we would like to show you a quick tour of the platform. Thank you very much, Andreas. Yeah. Uh, so now we've been talking about the why and uh, what the thing should do, so we shall, thought we'd quickly explain also how exactly it works. Uh, so first of all, it's important to understand that there are several roles on the platform. There's the theme manager, and he's the Inspire expert, and he does need to have a little bit of knowledge about the models and how to set up transformations between the local harmonized model and the Inspire models. But for the data manager, really the, that was the number one goal for that project, was to make the workflow as simple as possible. The data manager is the person, for example, in a municipality who has the data set, needs to keep it up to date and uh, to provide it. Now, the steps are actually quite easy. So this is a list of the data sets um, that belong to one particular data manager. And at the bottom, there's a big button, create new data set. Well, that's the first step. Then they pick a configuration, so we call that a theme, like literally an Inspire theme, for example, that you want to uh, create data for using this platform. Then it's a simple drag and drop, you upload your files, there's a validation happening in that step directly, so if there's any warning or a critical error, the uh, validation will show you, yeah, that file has some problem. For example, it doesn't match the expected schema, so there might be some problems later on. After that happens, the next step is the metadata entry. And we all love, auto, uh, we all love manual metadata entry, right? So uh, what we've done is actually automate that as far as possible. And usually that means that uh, based on the information from the data set itself, from the user's context, it's his organization, we can supply yeah, about 100% of the metadata. Sometimes there's some manual overrides required, uh, but generally it's, it's like literally one field that you need to enter. Yeah, and then the final step is, uh, after you've done that, uh, an automated workflow is started that uh, publishes the services, in this case, both of the original data, does a transformation of the original data, and also creates view and download services for Inspire then. And that's done entirely automatically, and the platform is also configured in such a way that when anything changes, all the services and data sets and other derived resources, like metadata, are updated automatically again. So that's very important, so once you've set this up, it's, only, it's literally drag and drop, yeah? You, you drop in a new file and the uh, yeah, system updates all the services. Yeah, and that's actually already it. You have the view services, you have the download services for that. And uh, yeah, the goal here, is, as I said, was yeah, to really make it as simple as possible for the data managers who are, there are literally hundreds of them in this case, whereas there's only one or two of the theme managers. So these are usually experts, but the large number of people now has a very low barrier to entry to just using that system continuously. And we've also been able to work with them to show that they can use that without problems, even with the, yeah, more than 100 users from different uh, organizations. Uh, they can just continuously upload data and uh, yeah, have an ex increased access volume. 
so far. Yeah, we've also been uh, getting really good feedback on the robustness, on the availability. And finally, it's, it's because it's a cloud platform, uh, it's also for them very cost effective and they've explicitly said that. So for them, that was also a statement that they made continuously is that for them, this approach is a, is a really cost effective solution. Yeah, that's essentially what uh, Mr. Dumayer, Andreas and me wanted to show you today about uh, how, yeah, as I said, more than 100 municipalities collaborated to get an efficient Inspire platform up. And if you have any questions, we're here to take them. Now the floor is open. Um, do you have any questions? Yes, mm -hmm. guy in the back. I think just a get moment. A um, get the mic. Bless you. Yes. Ah. Yeah. Thank you very much. It was a really awesome uh, shank pull. Uh, yes, uh, you show this um, uh, interface uh, for the system allowing uh, thematic uh, or data providers to upload data. Uh, and then, as I understood well, this, uh, this platform also allows to publish in uh, automatically, no? Yeah. After the transformation into an Inspire compliant uh, service. Um, did you use in, uh, existing tools uh, for doing so and you have integrated uh, different components? Is, if it's the case, uh, could you explain a bit more uh, from the, let's mm -hmm. call it, uh, software architecture point of view? Yeah, so obviously we didn't have to start from zero. There are two main components. One is for the data publishing, we used Degree. And uh, the other one is for the data transformation, we used Hale. And uh, those, uh, the rest is essentially then, yeah, there's lots of new components related to managing all the metadata and so on. So that's a pretty particular analysis process there uh, that wasn't there before. Uh, but I think the key is really bringing that together and uh, integrating it so that it will work in these automated seamless workflows. And that's also where a lot of the effort actually went, just making sure the things play together nicely. Thank you very much. All right. Lots yes, of smiling more faces. Questions? So everybody's happy. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, um, I, I would li like to just uh, uh, ask you a, a question as regards uh, basically resources. Um, yep. As a, you know, Inspire from the from the outset actually requires a, a substantial amount of resource uh, investment, and then mm -hmm. it. Uh, it generates the benefits. Um, uh, how did this uh, happen, actually, uh, in in your case? So, was this actually uh, start the, this this whole process? Was this this done by the municipalities, or mm -hmm. were, was there an EU funding invo involved? No. Uh, so? Well, in this case, um, it was like this. The, first of all, the corporation made a cost-benefit analysis for themselves as well. So they they evaluated. Well, they, 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 first and foremost, this cooperation is about local cooperation. Yeah? So they want to improve how they work together across uh, the municipalities and the districts. And uh, they knew pretty well what they needed for that. And for them, implementing Inspire and the, their local needs was more or less combined in one project. So they could actually do the obligation and the, the things that they need to do to improve their internal processes together. And they'd made a cost analysis as well to find out what uh, they would actually need to invest. And um, yeah, came out with some, some numbers more or less and uh, decided, yeah, it's worth for us to do it like this. Mm. And then they actually contracted us to build the platform and the cost stayed below that. So for them now it should make sense actually. Mm. I see, okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, if you want to get a fuller demo or anything, we are here for the rest of the week, obviously. So. ARC. Excuse me while I struggle with the technology.
Good. Great. Good afternoon. Before I get into this, I'd like to make one thing clear. Um, SDIs are rubbish. Inspire is rubbish. The refit analysis is a pack of lies. It all has no value unless we make use of the data. And I'm, to, I'm going to be talking about the European Union location framework, which is all about making the use of the data. So first you'll get me uh, from the uh, European Commission Joint Research Center, then you'll get uh, my, uh, my colleague, the, uh, the manager of the, the project, uh, Francesco Pignatelli. They're not rubbish, really, these things. So, the European Union Location Framework. It's a project, it's part of the ISA program that you heard about this morning in the Digital Economy session. It's one of two geospatial actions in that, uh, that work program. The other is uh, the ARENA action, which uh, you will hear about uh, elsewhere. The European Union Location Framework is a very broad framework to promote the best practices to enable better use of uh, location information. It focuses on five focus areas, with one on the policy approach, a second on uh, the design and integration of e-government services, a third on the, the technical standards and interoperability, a fourth on return on investment. The benefits are, are critical in all of this. And the fifth on good governance, partnerships, and developing capabilities. So I said it's a broad framework. It covers all of those, those areas. And it's about getting better use of the data. So how has the framework evolved? Uh, I'll just run through the process that we've been through. And during that, you'll see the sort of things that make up the framework. Um, so firstly, we started around three years ago developing the, the strategic approach. We did a broad survey, an assessment of what things were important in making use of the data, in, in delivering value. We created a vision and, and through that survey and, and the vision, we identified those five focus areas that form the basis of the framework. We started some analysis of good practices across member states and building up our references. We then moved down into a lower level of detail and we started to put together some guidance. We have a high level blueprint of uh, recommendations, uh, which is the basis of the, uh, the implementation of uh, good practices. We have more detailed guidance in particular areas that are in the, the blueprint. And we created case studies and fact sheets around uh, selected best practices so that people could understand where uh, there was good being done. We started to get involved in solving particular problems. Some problems were so complex we had to do feasibility studies before we started solving them, and that helped scope what we, uh, what we needed to do. And you'll hear later about some of the pilot projects where we've done some really interesting things and delivered value. We've also looked at some of the best practice approaches that we may follow and which may become guidance for uh, member states, and they may follow also an approach on benefits, an approach to improving processes and using location information more effectively, an inventory approach for cataloging reusable solutions so that they can be found and reused more easily uh, in the framework of the, of the ISA program and, uh, and uh, the, the way it uh, enables solutions to be reused. So, do you use just geospatial data in your, in your apps? Probably not. 
it's usually a combination of different technologies and data. And so we're publishing uh, these solutions in that broader catalog. The blueprint that I mentioned, the high-level guidance, it's based on the five focus areas. It contains a series of practical recommendations, 18 in fact. Um, there may be more as, as it evolves. Um, each of those involves a checklist of things, uh, of steps to take, of uh, good practice, a rationale for doing this. Why are we making this recommendation? Who is the target audience? What are the risks and mitigations? What are the, the pitfalls that you need to consider? And where can I look elsewhere to, uh, to, get, uh, so, to get some good information? So this is all practical guidance. And next, we've, we've structured our, uh, the, some of the best practices that we've found that illustrate uh, those recommendations, best practices that demonstrate how those recommendations have been followed. So you don't just read the words, you see what people have done. And finally, we've created some role-based methodologies that cut across those recommendations and pick out what's important for different stakeholders, for policymakers, for those uh, designing e-government services, for those publishing data, for data managers generally, and for the private sector. So this is uh, taking an important look at good practice from the user perspective. In terms of detailed guidance, some of, the, some of the recommendations we've picked out and uh, based on uh, uh, priorities identified by our stakeholders and identified where and described detailed guidance in areas such as location privacy. There was a session on that uh, earlier this week. It was great. On public procurement of geospatial technologies. So, what do you need to include in your in your in your procurements? And the design of location-enabled e-government services. There was some really interesting stuff this morning on on how you go about designing your services. You don't sit in a room. You work through uh, the design of the services with your users. You test it out. Uh, 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 as as you develop the services, and you use location information most effectively in that process. In terms of our feasibility studies, Francesco will cover another one. Um, in terms of feasibility studies, uh, we are currently uh, developing a feasibility study on a really important uh, priority area that will become a future focus of our activities. This is on Gazetteer. Uh, data. It's an example of a common service where um, common data can be, deliver benefits for multiple applications. And we're looking at uh, what the scope might be. We're looking at maybe addresses, geonames, administrative units, cadastral parcels, buildings. And we're looking at uh, the use cases. We're looking at uh, supply options and considering uh, the different conditions across Europe member states, including licensing on conditions and what sort of licensing model might be set up for, for such a service. We have concluded that there are some good opportunities to build on existing solutions, uh, but to do uh, a project in this area to actually set up services, and they must be sustainable services, that is something of a challenge but it's a challenge that's worth, uh, that's worth taking. Uh, so this is ver something very important for us as we raise our ambition in the future. And to that, I'll hand over to Francesco. Thank you. Thank you, Ray, for um, illustrating um, the overall concept and uh, framework how we developed our thinking. Now I would like to, in the remaining time, just to give a flavor on in which area we try to uh, extend the INSPIRE directive, to reuse the INSPIRE directive in other sector, in particular, um, you know, for some application that link the um, government to business in the, for, you know, in the ITS directive, Intellig Intelligent Transport System directive, some pilots uh, we developed uh, in the Marine Strategy Framework directive. Uh, and also, we, that's what we are going to do in the future also in the energy sector, uh, and that will be more specific um, later on. 
This, uh, like as you can see later on, we will have, uh, in this week, we will have also additional uh, uh, presentation linked to this pilot um, in these two sessions. Um, so, pilots for better regulation. Uh, let's, let's start with the marine pilot where a presentation was given yesterday from our colleague. <clears throat> the monitoring of marine, uh, I mean, the member states they have to respond to different environmental directive, framework directive, uh, marine strategy framework directive, water framework directive, mm -hmm. habitats directive, and so on. So to meet, to meet these guidelines, uh, member states have to often process the same data in different ways, depending on the, on the request. So what we try to do with this uh, um, pilot is that each member states uh, expose the data and um, following the, uh, the INSPIRE model. So then <coughs> uh, for harmonized, up-to-date, and exposed via services. So uh, then the processing and the analysis of this data, if are compliant with this part, can be done not at the national level, but at European level, for example, for the Commission of the European Environment Agency. So this is uh, uh, one, um, one example how INSPIRE uh, model can be uh, reused also to serve other directives, so kind of aligning uh, different directives. So we reuse the same data and we don't have to, um, I mean, to, to, to give the same data in a different format. Another example where we are going to invest is at the moment we have uh, concluded a feasibility study, uh, but also in, for the energy domain, um, there are several directives require, requiring data with different scales and accuracy. For example, energy performance of building directive, energy efficiency uh, directive, and so on. So location data can help scale up methodology from building to local to regional and also to national level. So, <clears throat> and this part can really facilitate the collection, harmonization, elaboration, and access to and sharing of reliable data. So this is uh, something that we are um, investigating at the moment. And tomorrow there is a presentation, uh, um, sorry, Friday, there is a presentation uh, at 11, and uh, I will, if you are interested in this uh, domain, I will suggest to follow by our colleague uh, Giacomo Martirano. And um, so that's what we are going to do with the energy um, domain, uh, especially in particular for the um, building the energy performance of building directive, how an Inspire can help. Um, Another pilot where I would like to underline what we have done in the last uh, couple of years. So you see a slide like this, but behind there are two years of work with many partners. Um, and the, the difficulty here is that in this case, we involved commercial uh, map provider, so private companies like here and TomTom that are responsible of uh, putting the map, updated map, consistent, accurate, and up-to-date in our navigator uh, in, the, in, the, in each car. And what's the situation is that also Inspire can help a lot in this context because encourage the geospatial data uh, transfer from public administration. So in case, for example, there is a change of speed limits, and you can imagine in Europe how many there are every day, you can, um, if you put this data according to INSPIRE uh, standards, uh, there was an exchange of, uh, of, uh, of uh, information, and the, we demonstrate that using this infrastructure, uh, there was a reduction in the map, the error of the map from, uh, let's say, uh, uh, important, from 25% you know, to 7% in some cases, and this also, the update of the map, instead of being quarterly, now we, it's you know, on a daily update. This was a, a pilot that was developed with the road authorities in Sweden and Norway to start, but Digimove liked this uh, idea and this concept, and now is proposing an additional uh, project, a bigger one, that to extend this concept to other, to other country as well. And that's what we would like to, to show, that uh, there is a benefit in when you have standardized exchange of data, and this is an, a classical example where the, the public data are uh, used by a commercial uh, a map provider, you know, private industry. 
And so also the, the, um, in this way also uh, the, sec the business sector doesn't have to deal with disparate and different national process at regional level, uh, local level, but can have a more standardized, uh, standardized process that can, can reduce a lot the cost. Uh, so what we learned about with all these pilot and things we have developed so far, the demand for location-related information is growing a lot, and this will, is also a uh, uh, reason why the digital single market is, will, 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 uh, will play a role there. Um, so, um, and this can also support many EU and national policies and application involving public authorities, business, and citizen. Thematic community involvement is important. In the moment you want to use the geospatial information, the problem, for example, not the problem, but the difficulty, the challenge, is to put together two different communities that never worked before in the past. That's what we experienced with the transportation pilot. So we had road authorities and the people from Inspire working together. So it was not uh, straightforward, so we had to spend some time to write the terms of reference. Um, private sector is using uh, increasingly the, the public data, and so a better partnering is important, is essential. Um, and uh, all the policy evaluation, PSI, Inspire, Digital Single Market, uh, you know, geodata management and reuse need to be improved. Public sector data is an engine for job creation. Um, there is also potential there to link location and statistics. Um, the two actions that uh, Ray mentioned before, we have created a complementary framework and we will continue in the future. So we will develop common solution services. The UGA theory was one of, uh, of the example. And also we need to consider the technological impact of all the new uh, technology and, uh, uh, you know, like big data, link open data, cloud, infrastructure, internet of things, and so on. So we need to, to be fast with quick win application, otherwise the technology um, is uh, changing so fast. Just to recall why, uh, so there is, a, as I said before, in the digital single market, location-based uh, services will be, in 2020, the use of geolocation data will, will generate 5 million, five billion uh, in consumer value worldwide. That's what Deloitte said some time ago. And so the importance of this geospatial technology is fundamental for the data economy. And in spite, when we speak about uh, um, geospatial, anything geospatial is considered now li like lingua franca. So everybody is referring to Inspire. That's why we need to continue in this, uh, in this direction. This morning, Margarita Bacassi's uh, ex um, uh, proposed in which way INSPIRE can serve also e-government uh, purposes and interoperability, improved interoperability, and uh, INSPIRE directive will be uh, considered and channeled through the ELIS action, which is the continuation of the ULF and ARENA, which will merge together for the next four or five years. That's my last slide. That's what we will uh, are proposing now and uh, start to work with the ISA Square action in ELIS for the next uh, four years. We want to build, f uh, we want to find solution for e-government based on Inspire, and we want to act as a geo-knowledge base for in the ISA square in the future program of interoperability. So we want to uh, have electronic, uh, um, uh, there are many applications we want to develop in this context. We will want to support the digital single market, better regulation, public sector, modernization. These are the overall goal. And we want to link, as I said, geodata and statistics. So all things I've said in the past will be covered in this action. So um, I would like to invite you uh, tomorrow that we will we'll start with a workshop where we will discuss the results we achieved so far. And also we want to know from you, uh, expert and, you know, Whatever, uh, any criticisms would be, or any proposal uh, for how to set priority for the future, in, in, tomorrow morning there is an opportunity there. And we would like to also to extend our network, not only to inspire, but also to e-government people. That's all for me, and if you have questions, thank you.
Thank you very much. The floor is open. If you have any questions, perhaps, to the speakers. Yes, um, I have a, a question as regards the ISA Square uh, program. Are you envisaging um, uh, funding opportunities for the uh, uh, different uh, governmental uh, services, public authorities, or perhaps other communities uh, under this uh, program? Uh, yes, the ISA Square is, um, is a program where um, there are, um, you can only have funding through framework contract. There is framework contract established, and uh, so there are, there will be a new uh, framework contract will be uh, established next year. And so um, companies that participate to this uh, uh, contract can develop the concept. So what we do normally, we will uh, establish an ISA working group on geospatial um, composed by representative of different member states that give the guidelines which are the, their priority. They, um, they also validate our results. And then we define the, the priority for, 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 but there is no possibility to have direct uh, funding uh, for implement. These other instruments are, uh, are for these purposes, like CEF. Uh, these are the way they develop when uh, some pilot concept is mature enough, then you can develop at European level in, with different member states. Okay, thank you very much. So if there are no more questions, uh, I'd like to thank you once again for the excellent thank presentation. Um, yes, now for, the, uh, for our fourth uh, presentation. <laughs> Yes, and the floor is yours. Good afternoon. I'm Lisbeth. I'm working for the Planet Information Agency uh, in Belgium. And together with my colleague, Hendrik, I present to you the large scale reference database of Flanders. In short, we call it LRD, or in uh, Dutch, we call it Grootschalig Referentiebestand, or, or GRB. The large-scale reference database is a product of the Flanders Information Agency in Belgium, and my agency has a task uh, for the Flemish region in Belgium to stimulate the, the digitalization of, uh, of the Flemish and local, local administrations. So what is the large-scale reference database? It is an object-oriented database with geographical objects such, such as buildings, roads, waterways, um, and railway, railways. It's uh, set up at a topographical base map of Flanders. And since the beginning of this year, it became an authentic data source, so which will means that there is mandatory use for uh, all um, administrations and also the utility, utility sector, so which will mean that all um, organizations in Belgium are using the same uh, reference uh, for their, in their working. Uh, the database contains, among others, about 4,300,000 buildings, 4,700,000 parcels, and we have about 64 kilometers of uh, roads measured. Uh, in a whole, the database contains of uh, counts um, about uh, 80 million current objects and 20 million historical objects. The LRD is a result of a public-private uh, partnership between the Flemish government and the utility companies, and each party uh, pays 50% in the fi financing of the database and the production cost and also the annually uh, updating cost of the database. Uh, the financing is uh, regulated in a uh, decree, um, and in, in that decree also the management and the updating is regulated. Now for the updating, um, 
the LRDs completed uh, for the whole um, Flanders region in uh, 2013. And since then, um, the database is constantly updated. Locations are of errors or changes, changes or missing or new objects are reported by our users. Um, we have a web uh, portal avail available where they can uh, locate the, the updates. Um, last year, uh, there's mandatory uh, error reporting for, our, uh, for all administrations in Flanders and also the utility sector. And last year, um, they reported about um, 15,000 uh, changes that had to be uh, updated. Aside of that, uh, the agency itself also detects uh, changes uh, by um, screening aerial photographs. All reported errors are controlled by the agency and uh, validated or not. And after um, and all the validated errors drive the different uh, updating processes. For the moment, we have about um, six different updating processes. Um, surveyors are doing field management in the public domain, and each municipality is updated about one or twice a year. Then we also do photographic uh, measurement in the areas that are not accessible for the surveyors. And then every four years, each municipality is uh, screened uh, after errors of changes that had not been uh, reported. So we can uh, keep the quality of the database at a higher uh, level. Then we have also a specific uh, project or process where we do uh, topolog alignment. Uh, between the uh, building and the parcel, so a building uh, lays within one parcel. And then uh, we also update our parcels every year. And since uh, two years, we also integrate as build drawings into the database. Uh, and these uh, drawings are sent to us by promoters of public works. Uh, this is an overview of, uh, of this, uh, are some figures about the updates of last year and this year. And so for 2016, we measured about uh, 1,400,000 kilometer construction and reconstruction of roads and about 26,000 new buildings, demolished buildings or renovated buildings, and about uh, 85,000 smaller changes, such as new poles or a new bus shelter. All um, the database is updated um, every day, so every day we have a new version of the database, and our users can um, use different products that we have available. They can uh, download the LRD in different uh, formats uh, on a download portal or on a download web uh, service. Uh, everybody can view the LRD on our central geo portal, uh, he opened, or our users can use uh, a set of web services that we have available. We have uh, several WMS, WMTS, and also web feature service, and all web services are built Inspire compliant. Now, um, some detailed information about our web services. Um, our uh, web map feature service and our web, um, our, our web map service and our web feature service always delivers the most up-to-date information. Uh, for the web map dialing service, we set up an uh, intelligent change detection system. So for updating and deleting, uh, deleting of cached files, so we can also uh, give every day a new version of, of the tiles. We also monitor and lock our services so we can see which services are up or which are down um, and also um, what the uses of the web services. Uh, last year we had about 400 million, million hits on our web services and 30,000 downloads of our vector uh, files. This is a view uh, of the LRD in Geopunt or web portal. So here you see the LRD in a color uh, version. We have also a version in, in gray. 
and uh, a version where we combined uh, the LRD with an aerial photograph. The more you zo zoom in into the web service, the more information you get. So here you see the buildings and the parcels and the roads. When you zoom, zoom in, you also see the, see the street name, uh, the number of the houses and uh, curbstones and the edges of the roads. Uh, this is a schema of our updating process of the web service. It's maybe a bit detailed, but uh, so we load every day a new version to our database. Uh, and at that moment, we also sent to our web map telling service a sort of a queue uh, of the locations where we update the database. Um, and every night we push our new version to a product uh, database and um, then we start also deleting the cached files. So in the morning when everybody starts to work, they see a new version of the, of the database in the WMS but also in the web map tiling services. Now I give the work, word to my colleague. Uh, the LRD is available as uh, free open data since uh, December of uh, last year. So before that time, only those who uh, financed the LRD could uh, actually download the data. So this were the utility companies and uh, Flemish government organizations, uh, including the municipalities. And an exception was also made for the emergency services and uh, educational institutions. But last year, the Flemish government and the utility company sector, well, they reached an agreement to uh, open up the LRD in order to uh, uh, promote its use and uh, stimulate or uh, promote the LRD as the uniform topological reference in uh, Flanders. And uh, as you can see from the graph on the, on the slide, uh, the number of downloads, so pure downloads of the vector data, increased from about 600 a uh, month to a mere 2,500 uh, a month. And this number remained uh, more or less stable over the uh, previous months. So note that uh, in order to download the vector data of the LRD, uh, registration is, uh, is still necessary. So in the next couple of slides, I will show some uh, user uh, applications where the LRD is used. Uh, there are some um, more ap uh, applications from the uh, public sector, but also, also some from the private sector. So uh, what you see here is an application developed at our agency. It was prevented by, uh, presented by my uh, colleague in the previous session here. And it's uh, basically an exchange uh, platform for uh, uh, plans of underground infrastructure. Um, between utility companies uh, on the one hand and uh, contractors or uh, someone who wants to do excavations in the underground. And uh, within this uh, platform, the L LRD is used as a uh, uniform res reference. Uh, so in the background, but uh, a lot of the large uh, utility companies also use the LRD to uh, link their own uh, data to the detailed road infrastructure which is present or measured on the LRD. This is an example from uh, not our agency, but an, uh, another government agency uh, responsible for spatial planning. So this is an uh, application in which you can, uh, an architect or a, a citizen can apply for uh, a building permit. And uh, in this application, you can uh, uh, select a location and then using our uh, web features, features service, the cadastral information uh, of the LRD is downloaded. So the parcels, the buildings, and the applicant can then use these data to make a site plan, which is uh, re required for the uh, uh, building permit process. Of course, you can also use it for, uh, for simple and co more complex GIS analysis. Uh, this is an example from uh, a small municipality of uh, Wetteren, where the uh, GIS responsible uh, person uh, calculates evacuation zones uh, using the LRD on a moment, uh, a freight train loaded with uh, uh, toxic chemicals derailed and were leaking into the environment. 
Uh, There's an example from the uh, police service uh, department who uses the LRD as a, a detailed uh, reference for uh, extant reconstruction drawings. And uh, then the last example is from a private company, Realo, which is a, a real estate, basically a real estate platform. Uh, and they combine a lot of available open data to calculate housing and uh, neighborhood par parameters. Um, so they, they also use the LRD, the parcels and the buildings, uh, to make an estimated value of uh, each uh, property, um, real estate property in uh, Belgium. And uh, as, a, as an owner of the property, you can then enrich this information uh, if you wish so. And in this way, they improve their uh, estimated values. So then to conclude this uh, presentation, uh, I will make the link from the LRD to a project uh, at our agencies, uh, the Geographical Base Registries and Inspire. Uh, so in 2015, we started a project uh, to build a system of uh, Geographical Base uh, Registries, um, inspired by uh, the Dutch and uh, Danish uh, example. And, uh, well, these uh, base registries, they, con they contain core information about uh, buildings, addresses, parcels, and uh, roads. And what is important is that these uh, different registries, they, uh, they uh, work together. Uh, so you can access information from, the, from a building uh, th through the address or the, other way, uh, or the other way around. In order to make this uh, project work, uh, we had to, uh, well, remodel the existing registers of addresses and roads. And we started working on a, well, a new register, which it did, did not exist in Flanders, so uh, building registers. And in the near future, we will uh, collaborate with the National Cadastre to build a parcel register. So the, for this project of base uh, registries, we, uh, well, we did uh, extensive modeling exercise together with uh, stakeholders who will use the, uh, the registers based on their business processes and rules. And within this process, uh, we ensure that there will be uh, semantic compliance with the Inspire data specifications, which will allow for uh, data harmonization between the, data, between the base registries and uh, Inspire in the future. And, uh, well, we are a federal country, so there is uh, coordination on the interfederal level between the Flemish region, the Walloon region, and uh, Brussels capital region, as well as uh, with some federal entities. Uh, you now, these base registries, they also have persistent identifiers and a well-defined life cycle. Uh, they will be compul compulsory, yeah, uh, and uh, available as free open data. And what is important in relation to the LRD is that they will, that they will be, uh, uh, there will be a combination of centralized and decentralized data management. So this means that authorized users, users they can add uh, objects to the registry. They can uh, update the attribute information. But the moment that uh, an object is present on the terrain, then the LRD, which is updated uh, very frequently, will provide the registers with the most uh, accurate geometry for uh, each object. So with this slide, I, uh, I would like to conclude the presentation. If there are any questions. So the floor is open. Um, yes. Well, it's, uh, it was uh, quite a, a long process before it was uh, uh, regulated. But um, at first, at first, uh, at first uh, utility companies, they, well, they had the idea of uh, making money from the LRD. So at first, you had to pay. But um, it turned out, out that uh, little users actually uh, were paying for the data, also because the main users are the government organizations, and they could uh, make free use of the data. So uh, 
well, it took some some time, but they finally they uh, they agreed on uh, on opening up the data. Um, any more questions from the audience? I have actually um, two questions. Um, one is that, uh, do you have uh, reports as regards uh, the use of this um, uh, platform for impact assessment? So for environmental impact assessment, for instance. Sorry, I did Environmental impact assessments. Uh, are the, is this uh, used for environmental impact assessments? Uh, by the uh, public authorities, the the LRD. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, used very much. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So we uh, we have uh, well a lot of contact with the uh, with the utility companies and uh, uh, regular working groups. So they also they also um, um, cooperate in uh, in making the specifications for the for the LRD in the beginning. Uh, and well, through this process, they they uh, all converted or use the LRD within their own uh, systems. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, just one one more question um, regarding the funding of this. Um, is there any any EU fund uh, involved in this uh, um, no. uh, project? No. Of that you know. Okay. No. All right. Okay, so with that, uh, thank you very much once again for this very inspiring, uh, very good uh, presentation. So uh, with that, uh, I'm inviting to the floor the, uh, the next uh, speaker. Speakers, uh, rather. From the Cartographic and the Geolog Geological yeah, Institute of Catalonia. The floor is yours. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we are going to talk about how it's possible to increase uh, the efficiency of this and the sustainability by institutional cooperation. And this specific example is the update, updating process uh, of the addre addresses uh, database of Catalonia uh, that is carried out uh, by the Cartographic and Geological Institute of Catalonia and also Diputació de Lleida. Let's have a look uh, at the content of this presentation. Uh, first of all, uh, we'll see an introduction to know the two institutions involved in this collaboration. Secondly, we'll go to the past and we'll see how were the works of both institutions before the collaboration. The third point uh, is focused on explaining the reasons and the benefits that bring the collaboration. After that, we'll see how we carry out the work together and what is planned for the immediate future. Finally, some conclusions. To begin with the introduction, uh, we are going to know uh, the both agencies that lead the project. The Cartographic and, Geo and Geological Institute of Catalonia, ICGC in advance, is an institution that works at regional level. One of its aims is to generate geospatial information uh, for the Catalonian government, the Generalitat of Catalonia. On the other hand, Diputació de Lleida works at province level and gives support to the municipalities uh, uh, and so on, it can also provide geographic information. Let's uh, now move on to the background. We are now to see the ICGC initial works. In 1999, Catalonian police uh, expressed the need of locate the incidents uh, that took place in the territory. There was no, spe no special data set at that moment that could respond to these demands for 
Catalonian, for Territoria, or Territory of Catalonia. So it was decided that ICGC would begin the compilation of a uh, geospatial data, data set with the streets of all the towns in Catalonia, collecting the street axes with their number ranges associated. Between 2000 and 2007, the first compilation was uh, finished. It was mainly compiled by field work. At the end of this stage, collaboration with several local administrations um, were initiated. In 2008, the continuous updating of the database uh, start. And in 2010, the addresses position were added to the data set, giving and increasing um, their, their position, the precision of the positions. Uh, let's have a look at the strengths of the works at that moment. Uh, the compilation was systematic and standardized with quality control, so we had continuous and homogeneous data set. The works were carried out by a skillful staff or personnel uh, with knowledge in GIS and used to produce geographic information. The result was a single database that was and still is used by the Catalonian government and the cities through geoservices. And what about the weaknesses? Uh, the main weaknesses is the high cost to get current, valid, and complete information. There were several problems with the different data sources. The field work cannot uh, guarantee the completeness of the data and also is very expensive. Working with other, available uh, with other available data has the same completeness problems. Sharing data with other agencies mean that you need time to contact with them and adapt to their model and understand it. And then we will you expose the points about the Diputació de Lleida jobs. Okay. Okay. Goals. In 2009, the Diputació de Lleida began collecting streets and addresses to meet the needs arising from their competences focusing on the local government. Provide the municipal mapping viewer of municipal valide database that will be used as a basis for the work in population census, tax management, and records management. Having a location of all households, especially outside the urban area. The work it method used to achieve your goals are, the council is provide of cartography plane scale one, 1,000 and update the numbering that reflects the, the, this cartography on paper. This format, this format will make field work much easier because there is no other easy using tool to do that directly in digital format. Once work is completed and perfect in paper, is scanned and uploaded into the database for the future data display and maintaining task try merging information with other database. When we use this working method, we found the next strengths and weaknesses. The strengths are, it is an easy way of gathering information. Complete information. 19% of city council have delegated population census management to Diputació de Lleida, allowing us to cross information and verify that uh, at last all the people listed in the census are reflected. Maintenance work tracking from Diputació de Lleida. And the witnesses, high cost street mapping digitalization and database uploading. This official information is only used by the city council and cannot be accessed by anyone else. The initial approach was sharing information. It's not possible because this information is incomplete for two agencies. The charger driver. 
As we have seen, uh, both organisms were spreading their resources in compiling similar information and for the same territory. That was the reason why the, they decided the, to work together, analyzing the benefits of this joint work. The advantage of working with ECGC. Reduction of economic costs. Digitaliz digitalization does not start from the beginning. ECGC has already an initial coverage of street mapping, mapping through the province and process to update it. ECGC take care of the, the, the digitalization. ECGC is a charge of digitalization and standardization. Experience, power, power, and systematization of ECGC as a special entity takes advantage of geospatial data generation. The systematic quality control allows inconsistent and incompleteness detection on the supplied data. Street mapping distribution between generalitat agencies and general public. And then, what brings war with Diputació de Lleida? Diputació de Lleida combines combine knowledges of the territory with the needs of the city councils, and knowledge of geographic information system technology with data model. Council access to information through a single party, which also performs the functions of speeding and homogenizing to exchange of information, question and procedures. Reduction of economic cost. Science, it is unnecessary to perform the task of obtaining information and answering questions for city council. Diputació de Lleida performs training tasks for city councils on the data model, method, methods, uses, and application. It offers application that all the council to have normalized address using only a single postal address database. And finally, what brings work, working with the city council? Close the territory. Close to the territory, more accurate and updated access to the information as the city council, as an official body on postal addresses, allows more complete and current information of the square directory. The main trigger of the change. We are one mother, streets and addresses, three actors, ECGC, Diputació de Lleida and City Council, three similar but different language. We need a common language and understand, inspire, inspire, and a translator for municipality to consider their content. The common language is BDMAC, BDMAC, and the translator for the City Council is Sidmund. Sorry. The BDMAC model is defined by the Working Group of the Catalonia Commission of Cartographic Coordination, in which representative of City Council, Diputació and Generalitat, in order to design the common address to data model, to facilitate the exchange of information between in, uh, administration. In addition, one of the requirements of the BDMAC model is the INSPIRE guidelines uh, compliance with the ensures EU European validity. And Sidmoon, the new version of Geographic Viewer tool, we allow to the Council to easy to view, keep and update the information generated. Let's see now how we are working together. Our goals, uh, as for Diputació de Lleida and the municipalities, uh, they are interesting. Uh, they, are, they have interest in having uh, informa information, both uh, graphic and content quality, and of course with low cost. Uh, mm, on the other hand, the aim of the ICGC is to implement a workflow. Excuse me, I have missed, uh, missed one point. Uh, another of the objectives of Diputació de Lleida is uh, use the, dis the distribution channels uh, for disseminate the information that 
ICGC has already uh, implemented. Uh, on the other hand, the aim of the ICGC uh, is to uh, implement a workflow, workflow uh, for the continuous update of the database, uh, a workflow that must meet uh, the maximum efficiency uh, with minimum, minimum possible cost and uh, goals for the general administration. It would be useful to get a single and official data set that allow the unification and standardization of addresses. Uh, it will be spread to other uh, agencies DB database. Uh, let's uh, explain how are we uh, dividing the work. Each agency is responsible for certain phases of the production pro process. Each task is carried out by the more suitable agency. In detail, municipalities provide the whole detail information to be compiled. They solve uh, the doubts and conflicts that can be detected uh, during the compilation. Uh, and carry out the final validation and official approval. Diputació de Lleida. Supply the base information on which the consul, uh, council uh, um, reflect the detailed information. Uh, coordinate the one, works. One minute. Coordinate the work uh, carried out by municipalities and is in charge of the communication between the ICGC and the 231 municipalities. ICGC digitize and compile the information, detect inconsistencies and lackness in the data sources, execute the control quality, the quality control processes, and review the names and uh, do a standardized proposal for them. I think that uh, we don't have time now, do, uh, doing the time, one minute, okay. I skip the workflow, but uh, uh, you can see that we are uh, in, in contact, uh, the three administration, the three institutions, uh, crossing the, the information and the questions and the solutions. Uh, there is a, a database uh, that is updated in the ICGC, there is the transfer to the Diputació um, database that is uh, visualized since the municipalities and there is planned uh, uh, next uh, in the future uh, this uh, continuous synchronization. Uh, the results so far, we have more of the 70% of the municipalities updated. Uh, some of them are in, in process to official register. Uh, in any, any phase of the update, we have the 26% and only um, 14 municipality rest planning. The strengths of the collaboration is that the information now is current, valid, and complete. Uh, the final product uh, has a lower cost than before the collaboration. Uh, globally because there is no duplicities in the works of the administration and individually uh, because each agency performs only in uh, certain phases of the works. Uh, each phase also is carried out by the more spe specialized agency and uh, the requirements are higher because we add the requirements of uh, each administration. The convergence uh, we have spoken a little. The only we, uh, weakness, uh, it will be the, the extra uh, work that interagency coordination, but in our case, it has been possible to carry out uh, successfully with a very good attitude between, uh, among the uh, institutes. Bueno, futuro inmediato. Sí. Uh, we go direct to the conclusions. Well, I think, sorry, I think we need to uh, conclude there uh, because we are running out of time and uh, we will lose the, the audience uh, completely if uh, we extend bef uh, after uh, six o'clock. So the I would. The conclusion? Okay, okay, just a. a the last, the very, conclusion. Very short, to conclude this uh, hearing, 
the goals achieved are uh, have a set of common data, have a geolocal in, geolo geolocalization of all house properties and city centers and uh, scattered, having an official registered of approved addresses by the city council themselves, provide information basis for other application of municipal management, provide information to standardization and postal address geocoding service for different administration applications and also for citizens, and provide a geoservice for distribution and public use of this information. The new model of collaboration between three administrations, City Council, Diputación de Lleida, and ECGC, is able to get better quality data than in the previous stage of collaboration, optimize financial and personal resources of partner, of partner administration, and having of effective and efficient mechanisms for continuous updating of the street mapping. Thank you.